Okay. Can you see me okay now too? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I uh, I keep having issues with my computer. That's why we were delayed. So, some reminders. Friday is your your uh, fourth exam. Um, and the homework is due on Thursday. And I, I'm just going to do a couple more examples on the on this unit, and then I'm going to start the next unit. Um, and you know, make sure you're working on the motor lab this week. You should be in position to uh, test start testing it next week. Okay. If you wait till the last minute, uh, it's not going to go well for you. That's why I give you. Uh, that's why I give you a lot of time to build the motor. Okay, I know there's a tendency to wait to the last minute, but it's, it, it's not going to work well uh, in this case. Okay. Um, so, regarding the exam, just one second. The exam will have five problems. Well, it'll have six problems. You do. You choose. You're going to do five of them. The first part will have three problems that you have to do. The second part, you'll have two out of three problems you have to do. You, you choose to, which two out of three you want to do. There's shorter problems. That's why there's five instead of four. Okay. Most of them are uh, one part. A couple of them are two parts. Um, really make sure you go over the homework. Make sure you understand the problem solving techniques that you used to solve the homework and the worksheets. It's really important that you go over them, okay? Make sure you understand the process that you use to solve the problems. Um, there's also on Canvas a set of conceptual questions on this unit that you can use to practice. The answers are there too. So. Uh, that should help you better understand the material. And that's really the last uh, set of conceptual questions I had. For, I don't have any for the last unit. I've never gotten around to making a set of conceptual questions for the next unit for a student to practice on. Okay. Do you folks have any questions regarding the exam on Friday? No questions? Okay, so let's get started. I want to do um, an example that you see in the slide. It's a rail gun, and it's, it's basically, I mean, it's the, this, in this case, you have a power supply. And we have a switch. We have a rail, and I'm going to draw a magnetic field into the board. Like that. And I'm going to close the switch. Oops, hold on a second. I'm going to close the switch, and what will happen is there's going to be a force on that rod pushing it to the right. When I close the switch, you're going to have current due to the power supply this way. It'll be in the clockwise direction. And if you use the right hand rule, this is the direction of the current in the rod, you'll find that the force on the rod is to the right. 
And so the rod will accelerate. But guess what happens as the rod accelerates? Like I should have this side open. What happens as the rod accelerates? Anybody? I mean, won't it eventually leave the field? It what? I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Won't it eventually leave the field? Well, let's say the field's always there. But what happens here? As this moves to the right. What happens to the flux as it goes to the right? Increases. It's increasing. So that means there's got to be a current that's induced in the opposite direction. So that the total current in that loop is the difference of these two. So I total. is I minus I induced. By the way, this power supply, uh, if you're going to do this right, you want to have a regula regulated power supply to maintain the current in the circuit. OK. All right. So this is the total current in my circuit. So what's the total force on this rod? The total force on this rod, at least the magnitude, is going to be my total current times L times B. The direction of the current is perpendicular to the magnetic field. And this is going to be equal to the mass of the rod times the acceleration of the rod, which is equal to the mass of the rod times d sub v rod over dt. So the other day, we did the problem without the power supply. The other day we did the problem, we just gave it a shove and watch what happens as it slowed down, okay? We derive V as a function of T with no power supply there. Now we have a power supply. So the equation is similar, but not exactly the same. And so my total force then is going to be the difference of these two currents. And it's going to be m dv rod over dt. Let's call this power supply voltage delta v sub s. And let's say that the resistance of the circuit is r. Then this first term is delta v sub s over r. The second term is the induced EMF, which is b. L V the rod over the resistance. And I'm going to get rid of the arrowhead. Any questions so far? And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to solve this for V as a function of R. By the way, what happens when this force is zero? When is this force zero? When velocity is constant. That's true, yeah. when the velocity is constant. So, so when is the velocity constant? It's going to accelerate to zero, but that's like the same thing. Well, when this, is, this guy is equal to that guy, right? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. When you induce current is equal to the, the current delivered by the power supply. And so you can actually solve for the velocity at which the force is zero, and that's the terminal velocity. Okay, that's the terminal velocity. But we're going to get the terminal velocity the hard way. But if somebody were to ask you, how do you get the terminal velocity of the system, all you got to do is say, oh, the force is zero when this term is equal to this term. In other words, when the induced current is equal to the current delivered by the power supply. And that's it. But we're gonna we're gonna solve the whole problem and we'll see that we'll see that expression again. Okay? Because it's very easy to solve for a V rod here. When 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 where the force is zero. Okay. So I want to continue this. I, I'm going to multiply both sides by R and divide by LB. So I'm gonna rewrite it. And I gotta erase my picture because I need more board space. All right, so I get the following. And what I'm going to do is separate variables, put all the v's on one side and all the dt's on the other. Okay. And, and then what I'm going to do is, I'm going to multiply, I just like doing this, I don't have to do this, but I'm going to multiply this through by negative 1. And uh, because I'm low on board space, I'm going to do the following. So I multiply through by negative 1, so now I have this expression. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to integrate this. If I integrate this, what do I get? And C is the constant of integration. And what I'm going to do after this, what do you think? What have I always been doing? Um, you're solving for V, correct? I'm going to solve it for V, so I'm going to exponentiate both sides. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to Don't multiply you? both yeah. sides by B times L and then exponentiate. So I get this. And, of course, this is just a constant. And really, it doesn't matter when I evaluate the constant, okay? I'm going to do it at the end, but... Um, this, just as a constant, I'll rename it. I'll call it that. Now I have to figure out what this constant is. I know that at t equals zero, v rod equals zero. So, if, so at t equals zero, this is zero, and this is one. So that means that my constant is minus delta v sub s. And so I have b, L V rod minus delta V sub S 
equals negative delta V sub S e to the minus b squared L squared T over MR. Let me rearrange terms. Basically, I'm going to solve for v via the rod. And that's my expression for the velocity of the rod. This is the this is a rail gun, okay? This the system is a rail gun. So what happens as t goes to infinity? If you get via the rod, that, that, that whole three of parentheses would just equal one, correct? Yeah, uh, this, this term is equal to one, right? Yeah. yeah. So basically I get V rod is delta V sub S over BL, which is the terminal velocity. And that, that occurs when the current in a circuit the, delivered by the power supply equals the induced current. Okay? Questions on that? I think I think all the, the steps make sense. Um, but I do have a quick question sure. from one of the first steps that you did. How did you know the direction of the induced current? Or like, yeah, I, guess, I don't know. How do I know the direction of the induced current? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, let me draw my let me draw the circuit again. I'm going to draw with the switch closed. Actually, this side should be open. Okay. So, couple reasons. We know that the current's going this way as this goes to the right, correct? I mean, that's from the power supply. Yes. As the rod moves to the right, there will be an induced current. Mm -hmm. Now, I can induce the induced current by looking at how the charge separates, right? Because if you use the right hand rule, you have the magnetic field into the board. Let me draw it over here. You have the magnetic field into the board. You have the V rod this way. If you use the right hand rule on this and you focus on the electrons, you'll find that the electrons are moving downward. Well, for the electrons, you've got to use the left hand. But, right, okay. so, you, and so the electrons are moving downward. The, po the, the charge is separating. The current's always in the opposite direction of the motion of the electron. So if the electrons are going this way, the induced current will go this way. Okay? Mm. That's one way. Here's another way. If, a, if the current is induced, that's going to produce a force on the rod. Isn't that true? Yeah. Which way must the force due to the induced current B? To the left or to the right? To the left. It has to be to the left. It's going to want to slow it down, right? Yeah. Because otherwise, we're going to violate conservation of energy. So if you have a rod with a magnetic field into the board, the force is to the left. Which way should I point so that the, when I apply the right hand rule, the force is to the left? Isn't it upward? Like that? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so that's another way, right? 
So there's two ways to deduce that the current is, is in this direction. One is by looking at the force on the charges, and the other one's by the fact that the, the force on the rod has to be opposite to the direction of the applied force. That okay? Uh, I think so, yeah. Okay. All right, I want to do one more example, and this has to do with uh, motors. I'm sorry, generators. So I said in class the other day, if you take a loop of wire, and let's say the magnetic field's in or out of the board, and I rotate a loop of wire about an axis that goes through this line, and you look at the change in flux, we can show that the induced voltage is N A B omega sine omega T, where omega is 2 pi F. Omega is the, omega is the angular velocity of the loop of wire. And we said that this is the principle. I mean, this is really what's coming out of your wall socket. This is how current, this is how energy is delivered to your house. You rotate a, a loop of wire in a magnetic field. And so this is the AC generator. And I actually have an AC generator. I will show that in a minute for you guys. Okay. So let's just do a simple example. Let's let... And be 80 turns. Let's let the area of the loop of wire 10 to the minus 3 meters squared. Let's let omega 377 hertz. This means F is 60. Basically similar to what's coming out of your wall socket. Okay. Professor? Yeah. Can I ask a question about your drawing yeah just because i missed um what it is so is the wire going is, is the horizontal line is that the wire or is this square the loop? The square the is the loop ah okay okay so maybe i should make it i should make it a dotted line this is the axis oh <laughs> so i rotate it like this right yeah that makes sense that makes sense okay because okay. i was curious how you got the area if it was just yeah yeah it's just the area of this thing okay that makes sense and so as this thing rotates, if the magnetic field points towards us, the angle between the normal to the loop and the magnetic field changes continuously. Yeah. All right? The cosine of the angle changes continuously. It goes by cosine omega t. And then the derivative of that will give us the sine omega t. Um, let's say we hook up this generator. And, and I think I showed you one of these generators the other day. I showed you one of these the other day, right, with the light bulb? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's say we hook it up to a resistor or a load that's 24.1 ohms. I want to calculate the power dissipated by the load. Well, first of all, we start with the voltage. Delta V. It's going to be 80 turns times the area. And you have a homework problem just like this. Oh, I forgot to give you the magnetic field. Uh, the magnetic field is 0.8 Tesla. Omega is 377. And then when you do this on your calculator, you get that your voltage 
is 24.1 volts times sine of 377T. The current then is going to be delta V over R. So if I divide this by the resistance, 24.1 divided by 24.1 is 1. The power dissipated is going to be this guy times that guy. And by the way, normally when we, when we analyze this, we, we analyze it in terms of the average power in a cycle. And we'll see that when we get to chapter 33. Okay. Okay, so we know V, we know I. The last thing to, to, to consider is when you have a generator and you rotate it, and we talked about this the other day, when this thing is rotating, it's easy to spin, you know, I just I gotta overcome friction. But when I hook up a light bulb to it, it's actually harder to spin because it's drawing current. When I have nothing connected to it, I have an open circuit. There's no current going in the loop that's inside this thing. Okay, so it, it spins fairly easily. But when you, when you put a load to it, in this case the light bulb, it makes it harder to spin. And that's because of conservation of energy. The energy that you're putting in gets used up by the light bulb. And so that results in a torque on this loop. Because you have a torque, you have a, a loop of wire carrying current in a magnetic field that results in a torque. The torque is mu cross B, which in this case um, is N A I. Across the magnetic field. If I write it in terms of the magnitude of this thing, it's going to be N A I B times the sine of the angle between the normal to the loop and the magnetic field. And in this case, theta is omega times time. So if I want to calculate the torque, the torque is going to be. 80 turns times A times my current, which is this thing, or this thing, sorry. Hold on a second. I'm worried the PowerPoint's going to get in the way. Okay. So I got N, I got A, I got I, and then B, and then sine of the angle. So this comes out to B. Look at my notes. Zero point oh six four Newton meters sine squared of three seventy seven T. So there's your power, there's your torque. And I don't know if you remember this that power is torque times omega. So if you actually take this and divide by omega, you should get that expression. Okay? This is an equation in chapter 10 of your textbook. All right, so I kind of went through that uh, so you get uh, another example, although you have a homework problem like this too. Um, 
I have here a generator. So let me, I have too much stuff here. Hold on a second. Professor, why are you setting that up? I just want to make sure torque and uh, velocity. Actually, all, all everything you saw for is still in terms of T, right? Time. Yes, so, everything is in terms of time. Yeah. So remember this device? Yeah. I was using it as a motor. It's in the lab. So I'm going to use it now as a generator because a generator is basically a motor running in the reverse. You put in mechanical energy and you get electrical energy. And so, let me demonstrate this to you. And I can run this as an AC motor or a DC motor, uh, a generator, sorry, AC generator or DC generator. So let me give this some power. I have a multimeter connected to it Hope you can see it. And I'm running, I'm going to run this as an AC generator. So how do I run this as an AC generator? I use these two slip rings. If I wanted to write it, run it as a DC generator, I would connect these two to the split ring commutator. And so I'm going to be producing the energy by rotating the coil of wire in the magnetic field. And notice that the current changes directions. That's AC current. OK. Now if I change my commutator, so it's split ring, like so, then you'll see that the current only goes in one direction as I rotate this. Or if I rotate it the other way, the current will go the other way, but stays the other way. Okay? So, in the case where I use it, design this as a DC a generator, I'm basically getting the absolute value of this. Oops, I can't see it. Sorry. Um, you're getting the absolute value. of this function when it's running as a, as a DC generator, okay? And all I did with this device, I connected a power supply to this, this set of coils. This produces the magnetic field. And then I have this loop of wire, which, which, I magnet, which I rotate in the magnetic field. So this thing can be used as a motor or generator. Just to show you how the motor and the generator basically, uh, how they're related to each other. Let me get this stuff out of the way. I have my old little toys, they're generators. I'm gonna connect them to each other. I'm going to connect, electrically connect one generator to the other. Hopefully you can see this. I actually need, usually you need another person to do this, so. Okay. So I'm going to hold one in one hand. I don't have a good electrical connection. Okay. I'm going to hold one. And you can see the other one spinning, although my hand's getting in the way. You can see the light on, too. Okay. And it's actually pretty hard to turn them because I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a significant amount of current. 
So you can see that one, I'm using one for as a generator and the other one's a motor. So you can use them either to convert mechanical energy into electrical energy or electrical energy into mechanical energy. There's a nice symmetry between them. You guys have any questions about that? Anyway, I just wanted to use the time to show you a couple more examples. Uh, be, uh, before I end the chapter. So that, that's really it for the unit. What I'm going to do now is start the new unit. The new unit is on induction. We're actually going to follow in the same vein, but we're going to focus more on circuits in the last unit. So is the last unit going to be more like circuits using this stuff, or is it going to be more like our unit um, three? I would say it's both. Okay. Because we will be using the material from unit three to solve problems involving circuits, but the circuit components... You, you, we will look, be looking at circuits with uh, resistors and capacitors and a new device, a new element called an inductor. When we get to chapter 33, we're going to use all three of them and analyze them in a circuit. That'll be your last lab. All right, and then one quick question before... Sure. Uh... To move on, but is this example, because in my opinion, this unit has been harder than the rest. Does the exam scores usually reflect that? Actually, no. I usually, um, I know this unit is conceptually hard, but students usually do okay on this test. I mean, when I was looking at the exam averages, uh, if I compare the exam averages for this test compared to unit two, they're on average maybe 10 points higher. Oh, wow, okay. And in fact, uh, there have been times where the average is even higher than exam three. Oh, I would like that. <laughs> but but um, part of the reason is the kind of questions that can be asked, right? I mean, I know the worksheet was hard, but I, you know, I, the second question in the worksheet, I can't ask in a regular exam. Yeah. But the purpose of that worksheet is to, to understand that no matter how complex the system is, you're following the same process. Yeah, I think the hardest part for, for most of them is finding TS. Like just for all problems, not even for the BOS bug problems, like just in general, when we need DS. Yeah, it is hard. You're right. Difficult part for me. Finding the DS is hard, and then the second one is finding our hat, right? Yeah. Yeah, so th those are always issues. But, you know, like, like I said, on a test, you're not going to have some horrendous geometry. And do you think just doing the, because we, um, I've been doing the, the homework, right? I could have read it 29 and 30, and uh, now I'm working on 31. Do you think just, just redoing those and making sure I understand that that would be sufficient to uh, prepare? I think so. Especially for this exam, mainly because, like I said, because of, you know, I'm limited as to what I can ask, right? Thank you. I mean, you're going to use the same techniques. The geometries will probably be somewhat similar just because uh, I can't ask, you know. We've done, we've done uh, wires that are either in the shape of a circle or in a line. I can't do something where I give you a triangular shaped. <laughs> that would be, I mean, that would take forever. Yeah. So, if you, I think if you understand the basics, you'll be okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 was, looking, I was looking the other day at the um, exams, this, this exam. And on average, uh, this exam is easily, the average is easily higher than exam two. 
And sometimes it's higher than Exam 3. Because, you know, in 3, I felt pretty well. I didn't um, do as well as I had hoped, but I felt pretty good about it. 2, not so much. So <laughs> I was just curious if this one, where this one um, fell in terms of those. Yeah. Sounds like it's better than 2, so that's, that's a good sign. Yeah, this one's better than 2. Especially since you've, you've, you've dealt with applying calculus to problems that for, you know, this is the second time you're doing it now. Yeah, and my, my approach to studying has drastically changed after the second exam. Okay, so that's good. A little better. Okay, let's take a look at chapter 31. Uh, 32, sorry. So we're in our last unit. The last three chapters are covering in our course. And really, the, the, to me... The heart of these, this unit is chapters 32 and 33. 34 is a very, um, I kind of really blow through chapter 34 because it's, most, of the problem, uh, most of the problems in 34 are, are plug and chug. Mainly because they're very, it's very hard to derive them. The, the topic is, if you want to cover it decently, you have to know some advanced math. And uh, we're, not at, we're not at that level. And so... I will do a lot of hand waving in the, in the third chapter in this unit. But 32 and 33, to me, are the heart of this unit. And they will set up the stage for you guys, for, for, for example, uh, Engineering 17. And so we're going to try to talk about today self inductance and inductance in RL circuits. So, one thing I've ignored when I, when I talked about Faraday's law, and I talked about emotional EMF, there's actually something I ignored, and I'm going to talk about it here. Now, the effect that I ignored in the previous chapter wasn't very large given the geometry uh, we were dealing with. So let's say I have the circuit you see there. I have power supply, uh, just real simple, right? And I have a switch. And I close a switch. What happens just as I close the switch? I get a current. But wires that carry current produce magnetic fields. And so there's a there's a magnetic field uh, that's being produced when I close this switch. But it's a time-varying magnetic field dur during the act of me closing the switch. And so this circuit induces its own EMF when I close that switch. There's a, there's a time rate of change of flux in this circuit. So let's say the current does this. And I apply Kirchhoff's laws. I want to do this. I want to integrate the electric field around the loop. But it's not going to be 0 here. It's going to be equal to minus d phi sub b over dt because of a changing flux. Well, if I, if I Sum the, I sum everything in this direction, then I get I times R minus the power supply voltage equals minus d phi sub b over dt. This acts as if I have another battery in here that's backwards that you see in the figure. It acts like there's a battery over here. 
that induced EMF. It has that behavior. Professor, is that second line, is that a minus or is that an equals? Oh. Here's an equal and there's a minus. Thank you. So it's not equal to zero anymore when I close the switch, but it's equal. It's equal to to some some function, right? You know, whatever that d phi dt is. And did the flux change from the first from the first one, first equation to the second equation? Are yeah, when I take in the act of flipping the switch, the flux changes. I go from no magnetic field to magnetic field, right? Yeah, I was just curious. In the first equation, it looks like it's the flux of, I think it's an A. You mean up here? Yeah. Well, I have the integral of the electric field over the loop is equal to minus d phi dt. Yeah, is there a subscript on phi? Okay, yeah, I, all I did was I wrote the elements of this integral right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the subscript on phi in that first equation? Oh, that's a B. Is, Oh, that is a B. Okay. okay. I thought it was a different color because the, 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 <laughs> the, the black marker doesn't come out clear. Okay. I'll use a different color. The blue one seems to work pretty well. Now, this term only exists when the current is changing. And it has the opposite polarity of the battery or the power supply. If I move this to the other side of the equation, you'll see that. But if I move this to the other side of the equation, I'm going to get, uh, in fact, let me, let me put everything on, on this side. I'll get the following. And you see that these two have opposite polarity. OK? And, and, and this is a result of a time-varying magnetic field. Okay, only the magnetic field is changing. The circuit isn't changing shape. And since the, magnetic, since the magnetic field depends on the current, then the time rate of change of the magnetic field has to have the same shape as the time uh, variation of the, the current. In other words, E is proportional to d phi dt, or that's equal to, sorry, which is proportional to dB over dt, which is proportional to di over dt. So this thing is proportional to the time rate of change of current in my circuit. Now, for this circuit, this term is very small. You don't even notice it. However, if you put a, a large coil in your circuit, that changes things. If you put a coil in your circuit, a coil of wire, Now, this is not small anymore. We call this coil of wire an inductor. OK. And it's really our last linear circuit element, meaning that if you put two inductors in series, the, the voltages add. Okay, if you put two inductors in parallel, the current's kind of, I gotta be careful because there's another effect that comes in, but they essentially add. You can take linear, you take linear combinations, just like resistors. If you put two power supplies here and you have an inductor, then if you take two equal power supplies here then, and you have an inductor here, the, current, the currents are just going to add together. The one due to one power supply and the one to the other power supply. 
That's what it means by linear, as opposed to a diode, which is nonlinear. So how does the inductor affect the circuit? Okay. When you close the switch, you have a current through a coil. You have a time-varying magnetic field. That means you have a, a time-varying flux, magnetic flux. And so you have an induced EMF that's proportional <coughs> to the time rate of change of current. So if I have just a simple case with a coil, like this, if I flip a switch to get current going, this thing is going to induce the EMF to counteract that change in current. So that means the current won't build up right away. You know, normally you would think you close a switch and the current does this, but that, that won't happen anymore. It'll actually take some time for the current to build. Okay? So instead of having a circuit with no inductance, that's this. All circuits have a real inductance, so the current, if you plot I versus T, sorry, the current builds slowly. Well, most, more slowly, it just depends. Depends on the inductance. This is not going to be a sharp curve. It's not going to be squared off there. It's going to, it's going to curve. Okay, how, how, cur how, much, how much of a curve you have there really depends on uh, the inductance. How big D5 ET is for the system. Okay. So yeah, you don't get an instantaneous rise in current when you flip a switch. Now, this term, we can right away say, is proportional to di dt. And the proportionality constant, which replaced, makes this an equal sign, just depends on the geometry. We're going to call it L. L is called the inductance. This is the, 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 the L. When you put the L in there, it changes the proportionality sign to an equal sign. So L is the inductance. And its magnitude is the induced EMF over di dt. Now, I also got to throw in a minus sign because of Lenz's law. So for an inductor, for an inductor, the, the magnitude of the EMF is just L di over dt. Now, what are the units for this thing? I have volts over uh, amps per second, which is a volt second per amp. And this is the Henry. So the unit of inductance is a Henry. Now, we've learned three elements of a circuit where they're described by their geometry. Capacitance, the capacitance of a capacitor depends on its geometry. Resistance, <clears throat> the resistance of the resistor depends on its geometry. And of course, 
and of the resistivity too. And then the inductance depends on geometry. And so you have a linear relationship between the induced EMF and the time rate of change of current. Um, generally, we call this the inductance, but it's really the self-inductance that is the term that we use. Uh, the, the correct term is self-inductance, but we always call it the inductance. Okay. And since the, in, the coil opposes changes in current, L is a measure of an opposition to the changing current. Okay. So we can experimentally measure L by measuring DIDT and induced EMF. And you can do that with an oscilloscope. And when we're on campus, we do a lab where we measure it. We can measure this. So what's another expression for the inductance? And this is where the geometrical expression comes out. Let's say we write the induced EMF is minus d phi of b over dt. Now generally, a coil has more than one turn. So I have to multiply this by n. So let's say we have a coil of n turns. The total EMF is going to be the time rate of change of flux in one coil times the number of turns I have. Okay. This is going to be equal to minus L di over dt. I notice I have a mistake in my notes. There's, there should be like a semicolon or something in between. You, you'll see what I mean in a minute. So these two terms are equal to each other. And I'm going to get rid of the minus signs. Does it look okay so far? Any objections? No, is there supposed to be a DT in the... PowerPoint as well? Or, or am I missing something? There's a DT here and a DT here. Yeah, in the PowerPoint. Oh, no, I, you'll see what I do in a second. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, what can I get rid of here? Can't I do that? Okay, so that's the second, the second half of that first line. Is it not D phi? D phi, yeah. One step ahead of myself. Okay, so there should be like, after the parenthesis in that line, there should be a like a colon or, or something, or semicolon. Or sh there should be a symbol that looks like this. Okay, right after that parenthesis. No matter what, I always keep finding errors in my notes. Okay, so guess what I'm going to do with this? Looks very abstract, doesn't it? What if I integrate both sides? 
What's the integral of d phi? Recording in progress. Okay, I guess I lost you guys for a minute. So I cut out. Okay, so I was asking, now that I'm at this point, what am I going to do next? Professor? Yeah. You're, you're muted. Oh. Okay, we're okay now, I think. All right. Yeah. So, now that I have this, So you didn't, you didn't see me, I guess, put the integral signs, but um, when we cut out. So what I'm going to do is integrate both sides. What's the integral of di? Just i. Just i. What's the integral of d phi? Phi. So I get n phi sub b equals l times i. And so l is n phi sub b over i. So that's how we can calculate the inductance of a coil. So then what would... Go ahead. No, I had a question, but then it like went away because I didn't know what I wanted to ask. But for the, for the phi, for Calculating flux, um, we just do that the same way we've been doing that. Yeah, same way. So yeah, phi sub b is the integral of b dot n dA. And so for various geometries of coils, uh, this is tabulated, and, and you can look them up online. I mean, if you, if you you'll see them in engineering books. So for example. Let me grab a coil here. This is the toroidal coil. One can calculate, the dodo, this one's pretty hard, can calculate the inductance of this guy. Okay, but that one's hard. You can, the, um, because the cross section is circular, if the cross section is square, it's actually pretty easy to do. Um, the solenoid is another coil that you can put in a circuit. This one, actually, its inductance is easy to calculate. Um, so for us, the, the geometry can get complicated pretty quick. So it's, it can be pretty difficult to calculate um, the inductance. Uh, the examples I'm going to do are pretty straightforward. OK. And again, remember that. The induced DMF is still LDIDT. Let's calculate the inductance of a solenoid. Solenoid is pretty easy. And, and again, I'm, I'm talking about an ideal solenoid, okay, not a, a, not a short coil, but I'm going to assume that the length of the solenoid is uh, much, much greater than its diameter. So I'm going to calculate L for a solenoid. So we know that B for a solenoid is mu naught times the number of turns per unit length times I. We want to calculate first phi sub B. We're going to put it in here and divide by i to get l. So let's say we have a solenoid with, and we run a current through it. B is uniform, and I'm going to choose my normal parallel to the magnetic field. Let's say the, ma the, the magnetic field is that way. I'm going to choose my normal that way. And so phi sub b is the integral of mu naught n times i dA. A is 
dA is basically going to give me the cross-sectional area of this thing because all this stuff is constant. What's the integral of dA? It's A. Then I use this equation to calculate L. I have the number of turns that I have in my solenoid times some phi sub B divided by the current. This gives me mu naught little n big N times A. And I can rewrite it different ways. For example, if I multiply the numerator and denominator by the length of the solenoid, then this becomes mu naught n squared AL, where n again is the number of turns per unit length for the solenoid. So that's it. I'm done. This is one of the easy ones to do. So little n is turns per unit length and big n is just turns. Right? Yes. Yeah, so you, you do have to count the turns on one of these. We have a coil in the lab that a student made is 3,500 turns. We actually counted them every single one. It's about this long. Why can't, why can't self-inductance be negative? You know, Why can't this be negative? Why must it be positive? Well, isn't, uh, looking at that equation, it's harder for me to conceptualize it, but looking at the one to the right of it, if you have n, mu, n squared mu naught al, none of those can be negative, because mu naught's a, um, a constant, n has to be positive, and area and length are positive, right? Yeah. But so that's that's uh, would be my answer for them. Okay, but 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 what if you go to this thing? Ignore that for now. You I mean, I, I understand your argument, but let's go to this cuz this comes from us using this expression. What if this was negative? That would change this to a positive, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That means then that if you have a circuit, if you have a circuit and this is positive, it has the same sign as the battery, the voltage increases. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So you, you'd have more energy, you'd be putting in more energy, you'd be getting out more energy than you're putting in, isn't that true? Yeah. Can you, can you explain why the voltage increases again? Sorry. I'm sorry? Are you able to explain why the voltage increases again? Well, because yeah. the, this, this voltage that's going to be on here is going to be in this, or or the current is going to, uh, let me phrase it, the voltage will have the same sign as, as the power supply voltage. It'll, it'll, it'll act like you have two batteries in series. If this is positive, this does not oppose the power supply. It doesn't oppose the current. It actually helps the current build. So it's kind of like the uh, induced um, current, where it has to oppose the, or sorry, the induced force, where it has to oppose the, the applied force. Right? Correct. This one has to yeah. Otherwise, you can't conserve energy. If I, if I, if this is, if L is negative, then this it acts like a like I have another battery in there. I have another source. Okay. That makes sense. 
and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Oh, how can you minimize the inductance of a coil? You want to wrap a coil, how do you minimize the inductance of it? There's a couple of ways. So here's one. Let's say I want to wrap this wire into a coil. But I want to minimize the inductance. What I would do before I wrap this around my, solid, my, my, my core, I bend this in half and I twist it. And what happens when I twist a wire? And then I wrap it around my solenoid, like that. I have the currents going in the opposite direction in this thing. So that's going to sure. cancel out the flux. Sure. Does that make sense? I think so. The other way to the other way is to, and don't do this with your motor because it won't work. Um, you wrap, you make one wrapping, and then you make a second layer so that the current goes in the opposite direction. That'll make your inductance go to zero. But there's a couple of ways. So so if, uh, sometimes you inductance is not wanted and so you have to figure out ways to uh, eliminate the inductance when you have a set of wires in a circuit for example um, let's do this example the self-inductance or the, the self-induced EMF of a solenoid of length 25 centimeters and radius one and a half centimeters, it was 1.6 millivolts. And you can easily measure that in the scope. Uh, when the current's three amps, and the current's increasing at 200 amps per second, what is the number of turns in the solenoid? Okay. So let's leave this equation up, L solenoid. Leave it like this, or like that. OK, so we're given. Uh, L is 25 centimeters. We're given R is, should convert these to, to meters. We're given the induced EMF is 0 0.0016 volts. We're given that the current, I is 3 amps, and di dt is equal to 200 amps per second. And we want to know the number of turns in this solenoid. Well, L is given by that expression, but L is also the induced EMF over DI over DT. I, I, I put the absolute value sign because we know that this is true. So if I want to solve for L, and I know L is positive, I've got, I got to find the absolute value of this ratio. 
And that is equal to What's my goal? My goal is to solve for n. Right, what is this? This is Okay. So I want to solve for this guy. So n squared is going to be L times epsilon, or E, sorry. Over mu naught A. I want to make sure I don't miss the term, di dt. And then take the square root of both sides. Um, I just want to make sure my math is okay. Okay, we're fine. I put in my values. I'm not putting in the units in the bottom because I'm running out of space. Actually, I, I guess I can erase. I can erase this. So I'll put in the units. The area is going to be pi r squared. And when you do the math, you get 48 turns. Questions on that? Not if you make sense. This okay? Yeah. Okay. Let's just do a couple more things. I know a little bit over, but because of the issues I've had, if you don't mind. Let's do, let's find the inductance of a torus, but um, the cross section of the torus is, is uh, rectangular, not circular. The circular one is very difficult to do, okay? This one is not. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that circular was impossible, but it's hard to do. Okay, we want to find L torus. So we have a toroid, and it has a rectangular cross section. Okay. So, the dot is the center, and this is the body of the toroid. The distance from here to here is R. And we know that the magnetic field is given by mu naught i times n over 2 pi r. OK, so let's say we're given that. L is the number of turns 
times phi sub b over i. So I got to calculate phi. Phi is the integral of b dot n dA. <laughs> I'm going to choose n parallel to the magnetic field. Remember the magnetic field goes like this in the torus. It's either this way or that way. It's basically a solenoid just wrapped into a circle. Okay? And we're assuming the diameter of the torus is small compared to its, uh, or the, 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 bo the body, the cross section is small compared to its actual size. So the problem is the magnetic field varies this way. So it varies along the cross section. So I have to find a dA or break this up into a dA such that the magnetic field has the same value. Okay. So this is R plus uh, dr, for example, okay? Let me rewrite that. So the width is dr, and the height is, um, what did I write down for the height? Sorry, I didn't give you the height. Is a. So this piece, its area, is a dr. So this, is A dr. And then B is mu naught I n over 2 pi r. And I'm going to integrate from here to here. Okay, the inner radius is r, the other radius is r plus b. When I integrate this, I get mu naught i n over 2 pi and then a dr over r gives me a logarithm I get that so that's phi sub b so then I put that up in this equation Uh, my I cancels. And I'm left with mu naught n squared little a over 2 pi natural log of R plus B over B. And that's it. And that's in Henry's. Okay? So my next item that I'm going to do, and I, I'm going to do it on Monday. I don't, I'm not going to do it here is what happens 
if I put a coil in series with a resistor in a circuit. This is an LR cir or RL circuit. You're going to be looking at that in, th in the lab. What happens when I set this up? Okay. And what we'll find is that I, the current, let me use blue or red, we'll find that I is delta V sub S over R times 1 minus E to the minus R T over L. I will apply Kirchhoff's laws. I'm not going to actually integrate it. I'm just going to tell you. I'm just going to set it up and say, okay, this is what you get. And so next time we'll, on Monday, we'll talk about the RL circuit. We'll look at the transient response of the RL circuit. And we'll, we'll analyze it. I'll give, I'm going to do an example. Okay? So I hope to see you tomorrow night. I have my office hours tomorrow night from 5 to 6.30. I'm going to assume you have questions. There's, remember, go back to my old, uh, the link to my old web page. It has a sample exam. So the exam that you want to look at is the one that says sample exam 3. Okay. Questions? Are you going to... You're on campus today? Yes, right? I'll be here. Okay. Yeah, I'll be here. If I mean, I'll wait until about 2.30 or 3. If nobody shows up, then I'm going to go home. Okay. Yeah, yeah I should be in by 11.30. Okay, sounds good. All right, so I'll talk to you guys later then. Good luck on, your, uh, good luck on Friday. Thank you. All right.